Hi everyone, I recently read an article for the Architect and Builder magazine in which I explained a few steps in which a principal agent can actually enhance their ability to evaluate an extension of time claim. Now the article essentially focused on the manner in which a principal agent should set up the foundation and the program or look at the program in accepting the program which will then build a foundation later on which will make extension of time claim evaluation much simpler. And I got a lot of feedback on this article. A lot of people asked me, can I please expand upon those topics? And if I could please show them practically how this would apply and how they can apply these steps. Now, this video will also be valuable for contractors who want to understand uh, how to compile a program in order to submit that will comply with the requirements of the contract. Uh, and not only that, also with the provisions of good practice as we can find them in certain protocols. Now, the first point that I mentioned in my article was that as a principal agent, ensure that you obtain the program in the native format, in the software format. I know this is a concern for many project managers. You've got your own software, you've got your own professional uh, software that you need to use and apply that's already expensive. I appreciate that. However, Having the role of principal agent, whether you are an ar architect, engineer, quantity surveyor, it doesn't matter. You need to interrogate the program in the native format. It's simply part of the territory of being a principal agent. Without that, it becomes a situation these days where we can almost say it's a remiss of a principal agent to manage a project on that level, be the agent of the client and not being able to interrogate the program and the schedule in the native software. You simply can't make sense of it in terms of A4 papers that's being printed out and being fed by the contractor. So step one, these softwares, MS Project, Candy, Primavera, these things are not so expensive that they can't be included in your price for uh, you know the job for being a, a principal agent. So include them. And again, using these softwares are, are not that difficult, especially if you only want to view projects within them. So if you look at the at this particular schedule that I've got open, an example, this, this schedule has got over 7,000 tasks. So for me to go and have a look at this on an A4 printout is simply impossible. Uh, when I've got the native format of the software, I can quickly slice and dice it up to different levels. So I'll slice it up to this level one. And you can see now I've got a very good idea of the works breakdown structure that the contractor con well, thought of when they provided this program. On a high level, I can make sense of it. And this will typically be the level you'll report to in terms of your employer. And then we can go down to different levels here, level four. You'll see that just makes a bit more sense. And again, I can go and have a look at individual tasks, how they interrelate to each other. And I've got all this information at my fingertips. You can go and have a look at the float, for instance. You can open up other columns. So make sure that as part of your tender, you compel the main contractor to provide you with their program in the native format. You are allowed to do that. You can't do it afterwards. That becomes a, a cost item. Or then they may claim that it's got sensitive information or whatever. But if it's part of the tender, it becomes part of the agreement. So make sure you ask this and that you obtain a copy of the native format schedule. The second point was that you need to ensure the right amount of detail is included in the construction program. If we look at this example again, you'll see that on this level, we don't have a lot of detail. We've got a foundation, a structure, and then the brickwork, we've got the finishes. So these are high level uh, kind of tasks. In other words, a low level of detail. What does that mean? So low level of detail means low level of control. Uh, more detail means more control. That's, that's the trade-off. But as the principal agent, you can see that on this level, we don't have a lot of control. In, in, in actual fact, we've got very little control. If something should take place on the structure, we're not sure where did it happen uh, or where to indicate it. Was it. If it happens on the columns, where does that fit in in relation to that task that we have. Or if something happened on the slab, we've got a delay there on reinforcing, uh, where exactly does it fit into the bigger task that we've got there? So this level of detail needs to be dictated from the beginning to say, guys, 
we need detail up to a specific level. And a good way to do this is to have a rule of thumb where we say any task longer than 20 days, for instance, or longer than 10 days, needs to be broken down into more detail or into more sections. So the moment that I open up these items or where I've got up to the task level, you'll see the more detail I have now, we can actually track progress and we can also track delays. And so if something should happen to the reinforcing, we know exactly where it happened and what is the impact of it. The third point that I made was to ensure that the program has got sufficient logic so that it enables forward-looking capability. And I think this for me is the, is the crux of the matter, is the crisp issue in terms of um, compiling a program, having a, a proper program, is that it enables this forward-looking capability. And this becomes the basis of analyzing delays. Without this, you've, you've got a program that's simply not, um, it does not have the level of integrity that allows for proper adjudication or uh, demonstration of delays or claims for that matter. So, and again, not a difficult thing to do. If we look at this program of mine, as an example, let's say something should happen to the excavation and that now becomes 10 days. What I want from my schedule and my program is the following. I want this prediction uh, or predictive capability. In other words, I want to show and know what is the impact of this on the remainder of my schedule. So once I calculate this, you'll see, I can immediately see that it's uh, actually impacting my end date to a specific date there, which is now the 3rd or 2nd or 3rd of June. And my baseline date there was 27 May. So immediately I can see there's a five day shift from that end date due to this change that, that has been affected. And the reason we can do this is because my schedule is properly linked. The interrelationship between the tasks are established. And this is something you can check. There are quick and easy filter checks for you to do. Um, in, in, in the program in Candy, you can right click there and do a filter for specific uh, types. So I'll, I'll check for this bar type an incompletely linked type which will then indicate to me which ones are open. There's other more complex tests you can do as well. But the idea is I can't tell you how many programs I still see in the industry that just doesn't have any links, um, never mind sufficient or insufficient. But the moment that one link is broken, I mean, even if, even if only a, a small link is missing from this particular program, we, we've got a problem and you'll see it takes away it's such a small mistake, but it takes away the ability of the program to predict. So if I break a link there and I want to do the same exercise, you'll see that the remainder of my program is not impacted by this change. And it's because there's a one, only one link missing, but it renders the whole schedule inaccurate and it uh, degrades the integrity of my schedule completely. So it's something as a principal agent and as a contractor that you need to ensure is there and that the program does have from the start this forward-looking capability that is sufficiently linked and that also the logic makes sense. It's uh, logical to start with. Point number four that will make your life much easier when you need to evaluate extension of time claims is to get clarity on the assumptions underlying the durations. So we need to understand how are these durations compiled, where do they come from, uh, and again, this is not too difficult uh, to, to understand. Once we have a schedule like this, the contractor in, in CCS can provide details of their production rates. You don't have to have everything. It's not important to, to understand each and every activity, but at least the major tasks, things like excavation, uh, working decking, uh, brickwork, things like that, that's production work, plaster, tiling, these kinds of things. That will definitely assist you as a principal agent to understand the assumptions being made. And if there are delays or additional work, then you already understand the assumptions based on the contractor's program. So for instance, if you look at this program of mine, if we look at brickwork, you'll see the assumption, how did I get to 15 days? It should be made clear to the other team members. And in this case, I said it's 150 square meters of brickwork. I divided that by 3.5 square meters per day, and that is per team. So one team can do 3.5, and then, so in other words, I've divided it by three to get my 
total because I'm going to have three teams working there. And again, this now shows you the resource assignment that I've got. And then I've added one day there just as my own uh, contingency or a bit of risk. But this is, is wonderful to have this transparency between the teams and between the parties to say, this is what we have allowed for. This is how we get to our durations. And as a principal agent, if you understand that, and there's an additional brickwork that needs to be added, let's say you need to add 20 square meters of brickwork, then you can quickly do the calculation and tell the client, well, if we add this brickwork and there's no other teams that can do it, and we need to add it on the critical path, then it's going to be a two-day delay for the contract already, unless there are mitigating circumstances that might cause him to work on a, on a lower rate, which is obviously possible. I'm just saying that all of a sudden you've got control, you've got much more control, you understand the underlying assumptions, it's not just something that's being fed to you by the contractor, you can actually ask for this and say, guys, part of the tender again, we're going to compel you to provide us information on the major uh, deliverables or the major operations and trades on site. We want to understand what is your underlying assumptions when you get to durations, what are your productions, so that we can understand that in assessing delays and progress on site. The next point was to make sure that your program contains uh, things such as long lead or procurement items in the schedule. Again, a mistake that I see quite often on many projects where we get onto site and then everybody's under this impression that the project will be finished by, let's say, November. But then all of a sudden we ask the question, but where's the lift? The lift will take six months to procure. And when we add that procurement item, all of a sudden the project's end date jumps by three or four months. Um, and, and this is obviously distressing, not only to your client, but to everybody involved on the project. And for that reason, it's so important that we build in these long lead items and show them on the schedule in some way. You can use the long lead schedule if you want to or anything. But again, as a principal agent, ensure that these things are shown on the contractor's program. A lot of work happens behind the scenes. Uh, especially in, stem, in terms of steel, for instance, where we need to have shop drawings and approvals of those shop drawings. And there's a lot of work that needs to take place before the installation on site can actually stop. And in this case, I've just linked this tiling, for instance, if we've got a special tiling that we need to uh, procure before we can do the work on this particular section. If that tiling, if that procurement item should actually take longer than what we've planned, I want to see that if effect and that impact on my schedule. And you'll see, you'll note there, look at this, this impact. So if this was something that somebody just didn't add into the schedule, we were all under the false impression that this building could have been completed in, in, in June or this particular section. Uh, but just by adding that, you can see the massive impact it has by having that on the schedule. So again, a schedule is not accurate and it'll have very low integrity if we don't include things like long leads, etc., So ensure that they are there, and especially when you uh, adjudicate delays. For instance, let's say you haven't provided the specific, the specific electrical fitting uh, as a principal agent by the baseline date here. The question will be, if, if, if you only provide it later in May, that might show up as a delay on the contractor's program. But in actual fact, the program is inaccurate if we say that the procurement of the tiles is going to take, uh, you know, 180 days. So things like this can impact on the assessment of a delay claim. So that's why they need to be there and you need to ensure that everything is in place and the, that we actually have an accurate schedule that predict, that's, that's got integrity to predict uh, the impact of events on it. The last point that I made was just to ensure that the baseline is set before we start tracking uh, progress on, on the schedule. And again, it assists us when we do uh, extension or delayed claims, when we evaluate that. It's just a visual aid, as you can see. Um, well, not only that, it also captures the durations in the background, the costs, the, the resource allocations, the links. Everything is almost snapshot into the, into the back end. Of your, of, of your program and now we can start comparing the planned, the baseline versus the actual and we can get these variances. So to do that manually and go and check manually where an activity was before the update and, and you know to gauge the difference becomes a, a massive exercise and that's why the, the baseline needs to be set 
to enable a principal agent to make a quick summary of where we should have been versus where we are. And you can see visually on screen now, just by me implementing that previous item, by having a baseline, visually I can quickly see the variance now between what was planned and the impact of this tiling procurement issue that we are having. How does all of this help you as a principal agent? How does it come together? I'm going to show you an example of a, let's call it a, quite a linear kind of delay that might be suffered on this project and how you will now be able to evaluate this. And I want you to appreciate the fact that it just becomes much easier to evaluate the claim when we've got this foundational basis of a proper program in place with these steps that I've just dealt with. Now, let's say the client issues a specification change on the tiling on this project and they give that instruction to you as a principal agent on the 22nd of April um, and you then provide that to the contractor. The contractor now needs to order this material, they need to get this on site and only then can they start installing the tiling on the floors. Um, the question is how can we handle this uh, delay claim or how can we evaluate it? I'm going to bring that in as a fragment and I'm going to show you how to do it. I've added the delay fragment now to the program. You'll see we've got the, and again, it now becomes linear questions of fact. We did get the instruction for the tile spec there. The order was placed and again, the principal agent can now adjudicate whether that is reasonable at the two days. If that took 10 days, then again, the question is to be asked, is that reasonable or not? Uh, the delivery allowance, that can be actual, it can be based on as built dates and then the, the delivery to site. And a, a third or another question we need to ask in adjudicating this is when we draw a line there on that point, just close enough to the instruction, where, what was the progress of this contractor on the project before the delay took place? We need to take that into account as well because it will impact on the delay. So now all of a sudden the adjudication of this delay becomes linear questions of fact. It's simple to see the impact of this style change as a principal agent, if you've got all this information and the program in the native format and you've got a bit of skill, you can even bring this in yourself and, and adjudicate the impact. If not, it doesn't matter. At least you can go and ask the contractor to add the delay fragments when they calculate their delay and you can now go and adjudicate those items individually. You can query some of them. You can say the links between them are not accurate if they are not, if they uh, have used unreasonable assumptions or they've took or they took unreasonably long to deliver on site i mean that should then again form part of their own delays so it just becomes easier to 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 adjudicate and you can see the impact you can see the shift off of the baseline as well thanks for watching i hope this video added some value uh, if you liked what you saw and you want to see more videos like this in future please subscribe to our channel on youtube you can also check out our training courses on these specific softwares that I that I'm dealing with and um, thank you for your interest in project controls